Hey, hi, David. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Hi, <laughs> Great. Uh, welcome to the 25th anniversary edition of the Fantasia Film Festival, uh, David. Um, awesome. I'm Tony Timpone, the uh, co-director of International Programming, and it's a great honor to welcome you back to our event. Um, you're no stranger to Fantasia. We played The Signal way back in 2007, followed by VHS in 2012. So this is uh, a little bit of a return for you at Fantasia uh, 25. Awesome. Yeah. So excited. And you guys have, uh, you have my buddy Jacob Gentry's movie, Broadcast Signal Intrusion as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's that sort of a signal reunion going on this year. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's exciting. So uh, in regards to The Night House, which our audience has just seen, uh, what appealed to you about Ben and Luke's screenplay? Oh, well, um, wow. I mean... Well, Ben and Luke and I have been pals for a while, and uh, we had uh, always talked about something kind of in this space, but I didn't get a hold of the script until 2017. I think they wrote it in 2014. And um, look, instantly as a, as a genre director, I was like, it's got changing spaces. It's got, um, you know, a house as like the, you know, a, an arena for the mind. Um, it's, uh, it's, mind bending it's um it's combining some of my favorite tropes it's gothic romance it's haunted house horror i mean there's so much in there for me as a filmmaker and i loved that it was a singular journey of a character that was very much focused on this one woman who's reeling you know after the the unexpected loss of her husband and um i think all of that appealed to me but i think the the thing that probably was the biggest influence was simply that i i found it quite frightening and uh, that I, I thought the script was troubling in some way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I thought some of the themes in it were in a very frank way, kind of confrontational and they lingered for me. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a script that I kind of couldn't get out of my head. And um, mm -hmm. I went from loving it and thinking, God, it'd be great if we could do this to just being very driven to see this come to life. And, and luckily mm -hmm. I gave it to the right people, you know, mm -hmm. they, they helped us get there. Was it difficult to come to uh, come up with a fresh approach to a you know, classical ghost story? Uh, I mean, it's always exciting to innovate where the set pieces are concerned a little bit. And so I know that we wanted to create an image that was refreshing for the image for, for the audience. That was something that they hadn't quite seen before. Um, you know, a way to depict our antagonist that um, captured the concept and the idea of nothingness. So uh that was a bit of a challenge to bring to life because we didn't really know what we didn't know we didn't know how to do it it wasn't something that any of us had really done before mm -hmm. um but other than that i think a lot of it was um leaning into the tropes as we understood them and just um trying to find our way to them and mm -hmm. um always trying to tether it to beth's experience you know to the topic at hand and mm -hmm. um you know i find that the scary stuff really works if it's predicated on a um on a performance, you know, on uh, a character journey that we can relate to. Um, that's mm. the thing that you lean into a bit. And then, mm. you know, scares are execution based from there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you've described the film as a deconstructionist ghost story. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think there are contradictory meanings, you know, um, there's uh, even in the note itself, um, there's uh, different interpretations of what the words mean. It's often at odds with itself. And I think there's a duality between life and death that's very fun that you're playing with. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> it's sometimes hard to tell if what you're seeing is a manifestation of Beth's mind or if it is a literal, you know, entity uh, or the ghost of her husband that she's interacting with. And so I think mm -hmm. for me, one of the things that's really fun about the script is that every time I read it, I ended up somewhere different with what some of those, uh, with, with, with the meaning, um, with how literal I would take it or how metaphorical. And so um, mm. I thought that um, that contradictory nature was just inherent in the material. And I think that's why we've called it a deconstruction. Mm. Uh, so much of the film is uh, driven by grief. Could you explain how you accentuated that theme? Well, grief is, uh, I mean, it's something that we all deal with, obviously, but it's also um, opens a character up 
um, for transition um, and change and, um, and a reevaluation of who they are, the world around them in their own life um, themselves. And so um, it's a very vulnerable place for a character. And I think, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, um, it's the driving question of this movie. It's like, why did Owen kill himself? Mm-hmm. Just the idea that it's not just a suicide, it's an unexpected suicide that's come out of nowhere. To think you know someone and to suddenly realize that they parked themselves on a boat in the middle of a lake and shot themselves with a gun that you didn't even know that they owned. Um, mm-hmm. the, the rug is coming out from under Beth's feet so hard um, that she has to um, recontextualize everything in her life. And uh, um, that's just a fascinating place to put a character. Um, mm-hmm. Usually a movie cuts to a funeral scene and then we, we drop in six months later once they've developed some concept for what's happening. But this is a movie that lives in you know, the four to six to eight days right after this happened when mm-hmm. um, you know, somebody's reeling. Uh, Beth is in, she's all over the place. And so she's mm-hmm. hitting a range of different emotions. And um, mm-hmm. I think that's part of the challenge and you know, one of the things that was pretty enthralling about the project for us. Mm. Was Rebecca Hall always your first choice for Beth? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we would, it would, I never imagined that we would get her. <laughs> I didn't think it would work. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately for us, she read the script and, and, and saw something in it too. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, early conversations between Rebecca and I, she was, you know, she told me, frankly, she said, I, I'm going to have to play this one you know, on a rather intuitive way and just kind of find my way through it. It's not, you know, where Beth goes is not something that you can over intellectualize, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think we both had to take the tact that we can't overproduce the performance. We can't over intellectualize it. We can't plan. What we have to do is kind of set the stage for something and see what happens a little bit. So for me, um, Sometimes it was about pulling back the filmmaking apparatus and just giving her room and space to be a bit unpredictable. Because if you're not careful, like the directing, um, you know, just the camera work alone or a de- determination to get a certain visual style can control a performance too much. And with this, Beth's out on a limb, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, you, you want that restlessness to be kind of present in the movie. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> sometimes you shoot wides. Sometimes you follow her around. Sometimes you give her give her. You said that uh, her, some of her performance was guided by gut. Could you give an example uh, from the film that a scene that illustrates that? Well, for instance, the big breakdown before she goes into the bathroom. I know it was going to happen. You know, and uh, I'd kind of say. You know, what if you ended up over here by the bed somewhere, <laughs> you know, and she would go, mm-hmm. okay, and um, we would well up to that moment, um, shoot the front end of the scene, um, and then just kind of see what would happen and the, the camera operators would improvise in relation to her. Um, and uh, as opposed to sometimes the filmmaking process is very particular, you know, if you're not careful, it can be try to say the line with your head just right so you can keep the light here on the side of your face. And, and that's where the visual style can be too controlling. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but that's a, it's a group collaboration, you know, uh, Elijah Christian, our, our DP, it's also on him to find a way to, you know, light the scene so that we have space to move so that the unpredictable can happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Beth is not your typical heroine in this kind of move, movie. Yeah, she's angry, she's bitter, she drinks, she's very upfront and rude with people. And she mm-hmm. confronts the supernatural instead of running from it. That's something that I really liked about the movie. Yeah, that was something that was very unique. In fact, I, uh, from a genre perspective, was almost like, I don't know if it'll work. Like, can you watch a movie where uh, the character keeps kind of running deeper into the dilemma by purely simple, simply like pure and simple genre standards, it's like, you know, don't go in the scary place is usually where people detach from the characters. But I think mm-hmm. the audience understands and intuits that her desire for answers is um, more motivating than her, um, her sense of self-preservation. And mm-hmm. given what the film comes to, that's kind of the point. And um, initially we are kind of, uh, I hope, 
uh, provoked by her curiosity and want her to go further. And then by the end of the film, when we see that maybe she's gone too far and put her in a state of, put herself in a state of peril, that um, that there's a um, there's a responsibility, there's a culpability that that we might feel um, mm -hmm. for having encouraged her in some way or another, just in our own spirit, just kind of watching the film. So I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of my experience reading it, but. Um, right. but yeah, she she marches right into the doom and uh, stares death, meaninglessness, all of it, you know, eye to eye, and mm -hmm. uh, reports back to us to some degree. She goes mm -hmm. farther than we are willing to go. Mm. Um, so much of the story is a labyrinth, you know, with revelations, you know, being unraveled slowly. How, um, how do you know where and when to parse out uh, the the revelations in your movie? That's heavy on the script development. You know, mm -hmm. you really want to make sure that there's a good mixture, that the, the conflict is swinging back and forth. And a lot of that's just, um, you know, narrative craftsmanship and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the wisdom of Keith Levine, Ben Collins, Luke Petrowski, the producer and the writers and, and myself trying to get in there and like really make sure there's story movement where that's concerned. You know, you mm -hmm. can't play revelation, 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 revelation. It has to instigate action Beth has to do something with what she's learning mm -hmm. and um you know if if hopefully if that work is sound um then the the mechanics the engineering of the story are in a good place um the uh the 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 narrative will move um mm -hmm. and you can take your time with things you can pull back you can let the film breathe you can let in some atmosphere you can give the performance room to explore things um mm -hmm. and just trust the structure so to speak Mm. Uh, that's kind of the approach for me. Was it difficult for you to visualize the um, the the negative spaceman, your uh, entity in the film? Yeah, I mean, virtually impossible. <laughs> it was. Uh, uh, I mean, conceptually, we could talk about it. It's based loosely on a, um, a, a, a you know very famous optical illusion we've all seen of you know figures appearing between pillars. Um, but uh, bringing that to life was a bit of a uh, bit harrowing in that there's lots of unknown unknowns. I've never seen this done in a movie before. And uh, we, we just didn't know if it would work, frankly. And, mm -hmm. um, but I brought on uh, Pat Horvath, um, a wonderful filmmaker, good friend of mine and a visual artist. Um, he did, I worked with him on an anthology, Southbound. And um, he had a little bit of free time and I just begged him, come to upstate New York, can you help me crack this thing? And so he would just go camp out in the house and just spend all night there, just staring into corners until he found <laughs> the right alignment for some of the stuff to work and then build um, you know, loose versions of it with um, uh, simple materials and stuff. And then that would mm -hmm. inform the production design. Catherine Eater, our production designer would then come in and say, I could design this kind of, um, uh, you know, wooden archway to support that or to emphasize that. Mm. So it was a collaboration on those fronts, but the, mm. but the optical illusions are totally real. You could wander through our set and it would look like a normal house. And if you stopped at the right place and turned your head in just the right way, you might see something you don't want to see. <laughs> uh, the screenwriters and probably yourself as well came up with the whole mythology for the uh, negative spaceman. Could you tell us a little about that mythology? Yeah, it's kind of an amalgam of um, weird culty artifacts. You know, you've got the Louvre doll, um, and then there's uh, Welsh turf mazes. Um, the Cerdroia was a particular influence and inspiration. Um, so the idea was that um, Owen, in his kind of culty explorations, had stumbled upon a mixture of different spells, and he was experimenting and, and, and working his own version of the stuff, you know, the carpenter's version of the Louvre doll, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we worked it all out. It's all in the movie. You know, the movie may kind of drive by some of that stuff for you, but uh, it's always felt like a script that was keeping secrets from me. And <laughs> So I try to embrace that in the filmmaking. And um, I would say that there are probably a lot more answers to, to those kinds of questions in the film than one might detect on a first watch. Mm -hmm. and whether people will um, uh, uh, do the meticulous work of digging around and uncovering some of that or not is yet to be determined, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it's all in there, yeah. Uh, the architecture of the three houses is very important to the mood of the film. 
Uh, uh -huh. Could you talk about, uh, describe what you wanted each house to represent? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I love to think of the house as a house, any house is um, both a representation of one's mind, the way you think, the way you compartmentalize ideas in your life, um, rooms, functions, so on and so forth. Um, it's also a great metaphor for the mind, uh, sorry, for the, for the marriage itself. Um, just in this story, you have uh, the idea that Owen built the house um, and uh, they came from, I think, you know, the city and Beth had some issues, um, which she hits upon in the film. And perhaps this is the idyllic version of what sort of keeps her on track. And so there's something kind of vaguely patriarchal about it that I think um, for me is uneasy. And um, mm -hmm. that he had designed a place for her to live that was also kind of a spirit trap um, felt fun and kind of insidious in a way and so mm -hmm. i think um you can read that literally in the story and then it's also um an expression of what it might be to learn that your life your marriage your partner is not what you thought it was um, um quite simply it's a visualization is that it's turned around it's the inverse um, mm. it's, um it's the dark version there's actually, there's an old, uh, did you ever, were you ever a fan of uh, Tales from the Dark Side? Oh, there's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember the, the old title sequence where they would have the, like, uh, super creepy music and the voiceover guy would come on and he would uh -huh. say, there is another side, a dark side, and they would, like, flip the image. Right. Just, like, it was like a simple shot of a field and then it was like a cheap video effect and the whole thing would sort of spin around on its axis. Uh -huh. They would do a flop. And as a kid, there was something about that that was completely terrifying to me. <laughs> uh, and the idea of a mirror world, that it's a geographical inverse of where we exist, um, it's, it's, it's the idea of your life, but wrong, uh, mm. just felt really intriguing. And so mm. all that influenced the kind of, you know, the inversion of the house and, mm. uh, you know, the dream space that Beth occupies throughout the film. Mm. Though we never made a supernatural film, the, the spirit of Alfred Hitchcock is kind of felt throughout the film. Uh, yeah. To me, there were touches of Spellbound, Vertigo, and even Rebecca. Uh, was that intended, or did any thought go into that? Or No, I, not, not really, to be honest, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, that stuff's just like, uh, I mean, it's been codified into so many different forms of filmmaking, like, uh, I'm sure... I'm sure it's in there <laughs> in some way or another, but uh, not consciously. Yeah. Uh, were there any other uh, 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 past supernatural ghost movies that um, that you wanted to draw from or that inspired you? Um, interesting, a, a contemporary piece that I thought about quite a bit was um, I really loved Personal Shopper. And mm -hmm. uh, I loved the way the camera behaved um, and just the, the kind of, the way that the lens got into a rhythm with the main character, I thought was really compelling. And um, I definitely pulled from that a bit. Um, we talked a lot about um, House of Leaves, actually. The, uh, uh, the Mark Danzelewski book was like a huge inspiration. Just the idea of changing spaces um, as a way to depict changing minds was, um, mm -hmm. uh, just feels underserved. It just feels like we haven't seen enough of that. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just infinitely fascinating to me. Um, but uh, Ben and Luke and myself spoke about that quite a bit. And um, mm. I think that was a, a big influence for us. Mm. How did you feel when the film was acquired, uh, sold to Searchlight Pictures for a record $12 million uh, a year or so ago? Pretty good. Uh, <laughs> that was <laughs> the best possible outcome. I mean, we, we, uh, we were, uh, I mean, Searchlight, was actually something we had talked about quite a bit. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Actually was the exact destination that we said would be perfect for the film. Wow. And, um, and, uh, and I had a, you know, had a conversation with him about it and was just very excited that they you know, were willing to take a risk on this film and, and believed in it as much as they did. Mm. Did you ever envision it as a, a big summer movie? No, I like a big summer movie. Like, I, I think this is like, uh, 
it's a particular flavor, you know, but um, mm -hmm. I do think that maybe it, it played scarier than, than I was anticipating, to be honest. And mm -hmm. we'll see uh, how audiences will respond to it. But um, the fear factor is something that you lose sight of pretty quickly, I think, mm -hmm. making a film, you know, because it can't, it doesn't get under your skin quite the same way anymore. And so mm -hmm. you're kind of operating, you know, out of faith at a certain point. And it's not until you see it with an audience that you're like, wow, okay, that got them, you know, or they responded to that, um, or this does linger. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, if the spirit of that stays intact, I am like very, very happy. I'm just trying to <laughs> there's a response to it, yeah. Did you tinker with the film at all after its Sundance premiere? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, you're rushing it to that premiere. I mean, I think we like airlifted the DCP into the festival screening. So uh, <laughs> I was watching it down in New York like a few days before. Um, just like, uh, it was literally like rushing to get on a plane to fly into LA to get to, um, to, to, to get to Park City. So I think, um, th there were some rough edges that we had to smooth over. Yeah. Just a little stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, uh, before we go, um, is there any, uh, uh, any upcoming films you want to talk about, uh, to drop us uh, a hint on like this, uh, Hellraiser, uh, reboot you're supposedly involved with? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't be, I mean, look, it's like a dream come true for me. Uh, the uh, 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 All is moving forward. We should have a pretty exciting announcement in the next week or so. But um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that's a universe that I would only dream that anyone would open the box again. Um, and to get to be there and do it uh, and be part of that team is like uh, really something else. So uh, more news on that, hopefully very soon. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David, and welcome back to Fantasia, and which, wishing you great success uh, with the Night House, which opens August 20th in theaters throughout North America. Fantasia gets to see it here in Canada first, and uh, good luck with the release and, and Hellraiser and everything else you're working on. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Uh, have a great day. Mm -hmm.